Welcome to the Homeschool Together podcast. Where one working mom and a stay-at-home dad help you navigate the nuts and bolts of the growing and dynamic world of homeschooling. With a focus on early learners. Like me! All the ins and outs of building and maintaining your homeschool life. Homeschool! Find out tips and tricks to make things like this easier. I'm reading! And ultimately, enjoy educating your kids. And what's that last thing? Have fun together! Did I do good, Daddy? (laughs) Yeah, you did, sweetie. Good job. Hello and welcome to Homeschool Together. Thanks so much for joining us. If you have a chance, head down into the show notes. Today's episode is going to have a whole bunch of links uh, to various apps and other products that uh, we may talk about. Um, In today's episode, we are talking about creating a tablet-based learning platform. Now, uh, today I'm going to be flying solo because my lovely wife is finishing up her last play. She's been stage managing a local a production of Elf here in the local area, and she's going to be gassed when she comes home, and she won't have any time, so I'm going to be fly, flying solo with this episode, and it's a little bit more of a kind of a tech-oriented episode, um, but so let's get into it. Basically, we, we are going to be talking a little bit about how to build a tablet-based learning platform, so it's very likely in the next couple of weeks your kids may be getting their first tablet, and it's come, we're coming up to the holiday season here, um, or they may be giving it to it by a uh, you know, grandma or grandpa or whatnot. And you may want to think about, well, how can I start to take this tablet or some type of, you know, whether it's an iPad or an Android tablet and use this to my homeschooling benefit? You know, I know a lot of us are a little anxious around including, you know, screens and, you know, not just phones, but also tablets and TV and whatnot, uh, video gaming and, and, all, and the like. Uh, in our children's, you know, lives and not just our lives, but in our our education, in our homeschool. And, you know, we can be apprehensive about it, but also we can say, well, if, it, if they are going to exist, which they do, um, and they are kind of ubiquitous, you know, how can we, you know, channel that and how can we use that for the, for good, for, for us to build essentially um, a resource that we can leverage at different times. And so today we're going to talk a, a lot about building, taking that tablet and turning it into kind of like a one-stop shop aid for the educator, but also for the student and give them things that they may want uh, to, you know, pursue, whether it's learning or writing or art or music. You know, how can we transform this device that we have a little bit of apprehension towards and actually use it towards the good? So the first thing we talk about is, you know, tablets are everywhere, tablets and iPads and and iPhones and Android phones are kind of everywhere and they come in all various sizes. And, you know, even the phones are so large sometimes that, you know, they could almost mimic a small tablet um, in their functionality because of the size of the screen, especially with a small, a small child, it would, it would look very large as a tablet would to us as adults. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about, you know, there's a wide range of free apps and low-cost applications that, you know, enable certain functionality and enable certain capabilities. One thing that I love about tablets is that they are book-sized. So r- right there, if we can leverage our tablet into some type of reading device or some type of reading application, using reading applications to, you know, drive literacy or, you know, uh, f- you know reading fluency that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, you know, bringing our curriculums into the tablet, you know, they're built in book sized things. And that is something that's really, really powerful in the sense that you can, you can store that device. You can, you can store a lot of books in that device. You can take that device anywhere you, anywhere you go, a tablet can slide into, you know, a purse or a backpack. It's really, really portable. So it's super powerful in that, in that respect. One thing that we always do with tablets is we want to treat them as uh, tools and not distractions. So for us and our choices, we we kind of eliminate the idea of play on the tablet. Now we do have some games and some like art art activities, and and in some respects, some of the apps that we'll talk about today they are playful. You know, if you're like filming a movie with your your minifig, you know, your your Lego minifigs, or if you're doing stop motion animation or you're doing some art. I mean, in a sense, that is sort of play. Um, well, what we we try not to do is like, okay, here's a movie. Stare at the movie on the on the on the iPad, 
or you know uh, play this video game while we go and do something. That's something that we avoid. And if, if you choose to do that in your homeschool and, and in your family, that's fine. That's just something we chose not to do. So we kind of focus on educational things and not use it as something that is a source of play. You know, for like, for example, my, my three-year-old will very often get to watch YouTube videos at grandma's house. And that becomes a thing she wants to do all the time. And that's not really something that I would do. Um, but I, you know, I let it go. It's grandma. I let her have some fun with, it, with her. Um, but that's like kind of an idea where like, like that three-year-old gets kind of distracted and taken away from, you know, the other possibilities that could be put onto the tablet or the, or the iPhone in that, in that, in that um, circumstance. So we'll be talking a lot about Android and iPad um, devices. They're kind of ubiquitous. They're kind of like the same in a lot of respects. Some people will mince those words like, oh, Android does these things and iPad does these things. But essentially they're the same thing. They're some type of computing device that has the ability to install applications on them and they will then perform some action, whatever that might be. Um, we will not talk about Microsoft Surfaces. So Surface is more like a PC. Now I know they, they have some like lower end versions of the Microsoft Surface, but they do function and act very much like a essentially a, a regular computer. So we're not gonna really talk about those as much because they can tend to get very expensive. And the whole idea with using a tablet as kind of a learning based platform is you don't want to spend a lot of money doing that. And, you know, very often you can get a uh, refurbished iPad or, or even a new iPad for, you know, three or $400 and a tablet can be as low as 200. And so that's very affordable. You know, if you want to get into something like this, I think the surfaces can be, you know, they vary wild, wildly based on, you know, the capability that are, that is put into them. So we won't talk too much about surfaces. So for many people, if you want to choose an Android or an iPad, um, it comes down to basically, you know, what is your family's familiarity? Like, for example, you know, a lot of our family's pre pre predominantly an iPhone family. So we have an iPad, um, but we also have an Android tablet. And, you know, I, I know my wife is a little apprehensive when she's using the Android tablet because it's a little foreign to her. Um, she's not as comfortable with it as she is, say, with the iPad. You know, your family may be Android users, and so Android's very, um, a very familiar platform for you, and that's something that you know how to use and know how to navigate around, and that's something that you want to continue through. And what's cool about it is a lot of times if you get into a certain ecosystem like Android or iOS, which would be the Apple products, there's a lot of compatibility across devices, whether it's like your phone to your tablet or your phone to your tablet to your iMac, you know, your Mac. Um, same thing with the Android. So like your Androids will all communicate together. Um, it's easy to share across them. A lot of times it'd be hard to cross and as yeah, the steal, like kind of a Ghostbusters theme is across the streams. You end up having to use applications to share across like, um, storage applications or whatnot. If you're going from like an iPhone to an Android tablet or something of that nature, um, you may have to use a, a third party application to, to kind of sync those two together. So do, do make those considerations and a lot of times people will either, it'll either be price or be the family familiarity uh, based on what ecosystems you already use. Once you have your tablet chosen, you want to be able to figure out, you know, a case, right? So that the biggest thing is you don't want a free floating tablet. You want to have a nice case with it, something that protects the screen because the kids are going to be using this and you want to make sure that you know, there's not damage done to the screen, damage done to the, the iPad, it's going to be dropped. You wanna make sure it has a nice robust screen. And then there, the question is whether or not you wanna have a keyboard in, involved in that as well. A lot of the kind of cases that come with tablets can come with a folding keyboard, um, a touch pen if you wanna have an active or passive stylus. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. By in incorporating uh, a keyboard and a stylus, it essentially can turn your tablet into a kind of a almost simple laptop, like a kind of a rudimentary laptop where the student can type and they can draw or they can write, take notes, annotate documents, whatever it might be. Adding a simple keyboard, a Bluetooth keyboard very often um, into the case. And a lot of times they are all magnetic in the sense that the keyboard will attach to the screen protector. So as you kind of close it all up together, it almost looks like a, like a kind of a file folder, like a, like a legal document folder. That's what ours looks like. And it has this flap that comes across 
and kind of protects it and keeps it all together and actually has the keyboard in there as well as uh, storage for the stylus. Um, when you have all those together, you've essentially built out a simple little laptop. And, you know, for example, our, the, the tablet that we use for the, for my daughter, um, it's just a simple Android tablet we got on sale for like $200 or something of that nature, got a Bluetooth keyboard for 30 and got a case for 20. So we were out the door with styluses, you know, keyboard case for under $300. And essentially we turned this into a low, a low end laptop. Um, that can perform a lot of actions um, using free and low cost apps. So that's basically kind of the gist of the tablets. So the first thing is when you're starting to think about the tablet is, well, how do you want to use this as the educator? So we, uh, you know, as I said before, we tend to use this as our choice to not have that many games, if any, on the tablet. And we treat the device as a learning vehicle, not a toy. Um, so that limits our choices on what we put in into the tablet, speci specifically for, you know, for our needs, but also for our daughter's needs and for both kids. And so our, th our three-year-old is actually starting to use the tablet as well as kind of a learning, learning tool, learning platform. So it's actually going to be used by both daughters. I believe going forward, maybe in the next few years, we will have two tablets. We'll have one for our youngest and one for the oldest so that they can have their own devices to work on and work from and be able to personalize and, and, you know, consider it their own and, and put their own apps in there. Maybe they'll have the different interests that we don't want to have, you know, one app here and one app there. And it's hard to share sometimes, um, especially when the little one wants to do Khan Academy and the older one wants to do her audio books. It can be a lot of friction there. So, Getting a second one for our youngest when she gets a couple of years older, I think will be the path we end up choosing. But for the educator, you know, managing the tablet across both kids is a, is a consideration that you'll want to have and maybe you want to get two. Um, the first thing is what I like about it is that there's no need for binders or printouts. A lot of times we've been talking about curriculums or curriculum choices that tend to be digital. Um, and so if you're following along that curriculum, you don't need to print anything out. You can store that in say a cloud tool. And we'll talk a little bit about, about that, like cloud storage tool, be able to have your curriculum right there for you on, on demand, uh, wherever you want to go. Um, that curriculum could be, you know, say like build your library, but it also could be like a digital version of your explode the code or digital version of your math mammoth, whatever it might be. You may have a digital version of your curriculum that you'll have readily available that you can either print from. So if you wanted to print from your iPad or print from your tablet, your Android tablet, um, or annotate those documents directly and have your student be able to, you know, write and solve problems or do, do reading exercises or read short stories, whatever that might be, they can do that from the tablet. This is also useful if you tend to be a mobile family, like a very active family, a family on the go, maybe you have multiple children. This is a way for you to fill in the gaps where time may be stressful. When we talked about, we have a, had a number of uh, episodes about, you know, homeschooling on the go and homeschooling, doing hybrid schooling where you have lots of, you know, lots of activities and you're doing a lot of things, whatever those things might be. Um, you know, I'm running into a lot of that now where, you know, I have both these classes that I'm doing with my, my, my oldest, and then I'm trying to do build your, um, blossom and root with my youngest and having all those resources together is a challenge and, you know, having the time to sit down and do those activities when I'm running back and forth from school or going to and from preschool or, do, or going to, you know, dance class or whatever that might be. If you happen to be a family on the go and you're active that may be something that you need to do and maybe think about is maybe incorporating, you know, your learning and your homeschooling into your tablet, whatever it might be. And that's the other thing. And just like a, a side that I'd like to say is that you don't have to go whole hog where everything is done on the tablet. You can have, you know, there's a gray zone from just using it to help augment um, that free time or those kind of moments where you might need to say you're at swimming practice and you need to do some math pro work with your, your other daughter or, or your son, maybe you use the tablet as, as that means. Then you can go all the way to the other side of the house where you might be completely on the tablet because that's the best way to go. So you can kind of see the pendulum there and try to figure out what works best for you. I would always say, 
kind of ease into something like that. Um, may, maybe see where the tablet can fill in some gaps or some additional learning that maybe um, you find that it's missing or is more of a challenge for you. Um, and then use that during certain times, like as if you were in sports or whatnot, and then see if you can grow from there. The next thing is, is that I love how the tablets can use leverage these planning tools. And so Ariel and I have talked about using Trello. Um, we've also begun to use another tool called Notion. Um, and between those two tools, if you do a lot of digital planning for your homeschool, especially if you have multiple children or you're a very active family and you want to do kind of digital planning um, for your homeschool, what's wonderful is these tablets support all of these tools. Um, and you can install them, and so you can make updates at your, say, your computer at night about what's coming up this week. And then when you can turn around and when you're out on in the wild, uh, you pull up your Trello app or you pull up your Notion app and you can go, oh, that's right, that's what we're doing today. We're reading these pages and we're doing these activities. So having that readily available in your tablet and being able to sync across all your devices is an incredibly powerful tool, especially if you like to use digital planning tools. Next thing is, you know, as we said earlier, you know, if we have those, you know, digital curriculums, it does make our, you know, tablet potentially a one-stop shop for curriculum, for books, for activities, for any type of writing materials or, or like worksheets that we have to do. We can do all of that on the tablet um, and have that stored and saved and, and for later use or for later reference. If you say you have a, a learning plan with your school district or your state, you have that digitally available that you can download and then put that into some type of digital repository that you can then save and reference if you are having to report up to the state on what you are doing. Furthermore, if you are more comfortable with using, you know, digital devices, you know, a lot of us use our phones all the time. And so we become, you know, in some ways good, in some ways bad, um, kind of you know, tied to our digital devices, our phones. Um, but, you know, because we, we, we rely on those more and more, going from, you know, going back to analog planning or printouts, you know, it can be very foreign for us. And a lot of us, you know, I find myself a lot of times when I'm writing something, like with a pencil, I find like, oh my gosh, I haven't, I can't even remember the last time I wrote something, right? Like to think about it because I use so much digital devices, we type, you know, with our thumbs, writing text messages or emails. In some respects, you know, I like to dictate things. Like I like to dictate text messages and I like to dictate emails. So actually writing things out is very, very foreign for me. Um, so we may be more comfortable using digital devices for a lot of things that we are doing, especially if it's on the educator side, you know, might be more comfortable typing into a Word document or a, you know, a Google Docs document than it is for us to actually write something down on a piece of paper. I know that sounds crazy. You know, if you, if my second grade teacher heard that, <laughs> she would be losing her mind. But, you know, it, for, for a lot of us, it's become more, more familiar with us using digital devices on typing, especially these little touch keyboards. I, you know, I remember when the analog, you know, the, uh, the, the, you know, the Blackberry, you know, physical keyboards were the, all the rage. And then all of a sudden now we have these digital t capacitive keyboards that kind of appear on the screen and people thought, Oh, they'll, they'll never like that. And I can't think of doing anything other than that. And I, you know, I'll even, instead of just typing, I do swipe typing sometimes as well. And so like, it's so, we're in so ingrained into using digital devices that, you know, going to analog paper printouts and going into printed documents can be a little off putting and a little scary in some respects. And so, you know, as the educator, you know, having a digital device like a tablet may actually be comforting in some respects. Additionally, you know, if you have a tablet available, if you're having to answer questions or your student has, or your, you know, your learner has some type of question that comes up, having that tablet readily available is really nice to like pull up some media. Like if they have an interest real fast, um, if they have a question about something or they want to know how something works or they're, you know, they, they don't understand something, having that tablet there for you to, to have access to the web have access to search, have access to videos is, is a really powerful tool for you as an educator so that there's no gap. You know, I always look at it as like, if there's an interest and my, my child has an, a, needs an answer on something, I don't want to lose that, that thread or that, or that possibility of, of education or learning, you know, pulling out your phone. We do it all the time. Like mom, how many, uh, you know, rings are around Saturn and you like, just quickly Google it for them. Right. 
having access to that tablet while you're educating, I think is a, it's a great way to kind of, you know, enable, uh, learning in those like sharp moments where you definitely don't know how, you know, you definitely don't know those answers. I always like to have some device there. And yeah, we always have our phone, but you know, maybe our phone we don't, it's being charged or it's, you know, in our purse or in our bag, having that tablet there and answering those questions real quick, especially if you're doing something on the tablet, you can just pause, hop into the, you know, the Facebook app or Wikipedia app, and you can quickly go ahead and answer those questions. So let's talk a little bit about apps for the educator. So I'm just going to go through a couple here. They don't, this is never, not an exhaustive list and you may, and we would love to hear what you guys use, um, any type of apps you have, because the thing, the funny thing is that there's millions of apps, right? And it's hard to list everything, um, for every single app. And, and we all have our little pet apps that nobody's ever heard of that we use all the time. And then there's apps that we've tried that are just like, oh, I don't know if that works for me, but so feel free to put them in the comments or on the Facebook page and feel free to share. Well, I think we'll go ahead and post a post on Facebook, um, on the Facebook group. And, and if you're on YouTube, feel free to just make comments below and just make your recommendation to help other people make, because a lot of times I find apps that I end up using and falling in love with, um, are not things that I search for. They're things that people recommended. So the first thing we talked a little bit about it is the planning tools. So Trello and things like Trello, Notion, can it be in something as rudimentary as Google, uh, you know, Google Sheets, right? As as well, if you're just doing some type of spreadsheet, or even if you just have like Google Docs, where you're just writing down what we're doing for this week, or making a note uh, real quick on what we're doing. And the funny thing is also is if maybe you do like to do analog planning, but on the go you need to be digital. So you, maybe you just take a picture of your analog plan for the week, right? You've written it down on a piece of paper, but you don't want to lose it. Um, how, how often have you seen something that you've quickly taken a picture of just to, you know, store it as a note or something for you to come back to and remember, I do that all the time. You know, I see something on the wall and go, Oh, that's pretty cool. I'll, oh, I just want to take a quick picture or I see a book and go, Oh, I need to remember this book. And I just take a quick picture of it it's because I'll, I'll go home and I'll, I'll remember, Oh yeah, it's in my photos. You know, those are little things that we can do for our planning, you know, with Trello notion, just taking photos or using something like Google docs or Google sheets. Next, like calendar tools, Ariel and I have become wedded to our calendar tool because it's, it's kind of our life, our lifeline right now when you're, when you're very, very busy and you got a lot of things going on, whether that's the Apple calendar or the Google calendar, there are a lot of other calendars out there, but we have leveraged the Google calendar because it, it does sync across all, all the devices really nicely. It's something that Ariel can update while she's at work. Um, she can do it on her phone and then it will come across and just sync across all our devices and immediately we'll send out notifications um, if you've got to be reminded to do something or whatnot. Google, Google Calendar and Apple Calendar are really, really powerful tools about that, especially if you have things that are recurring like sports or classes or co-op meetings or, you know, Girl Scout meetings and things like that. Not that I'm speaking from, you know, you know, it's exactly what we have to do, right? It's what we're, we're worried about on a weekly basis. When's that class? When am I picking her up? When's basketball practice? When's that? You got to keep those on, on, on the forefront of your mind. And it's really helpful to have a tool and a calendar to do that. Next thing we do is a lot of times we'll have the need to store stuff, right? We need to store stuff on our, on our devices. And a lot of times the devices don't have a lot of storage on them. Now tablets, like on the Android, they'll have the ability to get some SD cards that you can put onto the side and that, and that really greatly expands the storability of what you can store on that device. The thing is that about that is that if it's on that local device, it's only local to that device. And what I like is to have something that is syncable across multiple devices, whether I'm working on the computer right here that I'm staring at right now, um, or on my phone or on the tablet. I want to, I want things to be there across all devices. So if I make one update or put, put one document in that it's available across all my devices anywhere at any time. And that, 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 that is the cloud based storage tools. So probably one of the best ones out there is the Google drive. Um, with a Google account, you also get Google drive and with Google drive, you also get Google docs, Google sheets, Google PowerPoint, there's draw, there's like so many <laughs> different things you can get. But with that, you get is um, 15 gigs of storage. And for Ariel and I, that's what we use a lot for our planning on the homeschool on the on the podcast. Um, we put show notes in there. We we set up 
podcast, we actually archive our MP3 files for the show. Like the show that you're listening to right now gets archived on Google, on Google Docs, I mean, on Google Drive. Uh, and then we have, you know, all, all our curriculum is on there, notes that we're, we're doing, uh, working on guides that we're, we're putting out. So we use it extensively. And also we manage what our daughters are doing. Um, like what are we working on? What, what Ariel like stores all of the curriculum that we're, we're using it out there as well great way to access that curriculum really fast. Another one is Microsoft OneDrive. So if you find you're more of like a Microsoft family, you have that as well. And then Dropbox is another opportun- uh, uh, opportunity for you to use um, to store things. I use Dropbox as well for my writing. It's just something I've always used. So a lot of times people will continue to use the same products over and over again. Dropbox, I think, gives you two gigs of storage. Um, and I don't know what Microsoft gives you, but I think it's like 10 or 15 gigs. And then you can easily buy a little bit more. So for like a dollar, I think on Google drive, you can get up to like 50 gigs of storage, which is a lot. And I think we're up to the hundred gig now or something like that. And anyway, you can get a lot of, a lot of storage. Great to put your, your, your photos on there, any type of videos and large documents. I think we also pay for our Apple storage as well, just to allow us to have the, all that space to put all those documents and images and videos and whatnot. The next thing is, is you may want to do a lot of document management. So again, leveraging Google Drive for that because it, it gives you kind of a file structure that we're all very co- comfortable with, you know, storing files in folders and then putting documents within that. Um, Google Drive is really good for that. There's other other tools such as PDF, uh, expert. And then the one that I like to use is Foxit PDF, both the reader and the editor. So if any time you're having to use or manage or update or annotate any type of PDF document, I really like using Foxit because it works on my phone, works on the tablet. Um, you can put your curriculums in there. You can import the curriculum from say like a storage device. Like if you're storing it on Google drive and then you want to import it into Foxit to make some annotations to it. Um, you can also think about like if your child is working on some type of um, worksheet or you're doing math problems or something like that, they can then use a stylus to do those math problems right there. Um, so I like using kind of having a document management um, and editing tool and Foxit PDF is one of my favorites. Next thing is if you're doing any type of reading application. So stepping you know beyond just managing your curriculum you may also need to read to your, to your children. And it's really, really cool to have, you know, uh, applications on the, you know, on the tablet where you can have digital versions of books. Um, first one would be like the Libby app that that, where you can check out books from your library. A lot of the books, um, they do have a lot of children's books out there. So if we're doing, um, early reader books or if we're doing books for, you know, whatever curriculum that we're using, the Libby app will allow you to check those books out and you can read them digitally on your tablet. Another one is obviously the Kindle reader through Amazon. You know, if you're doing kind of a Kindle unlimited program or if you're just purchasing digital versions of books, um, the Kindle reader will, will be there for you. You can also send things to your, um, your Kindle reader as well. If you have a, um, an Amazon account and you have the downloaded uh, Kindle app, you can actually, they will give you an email address, whatever your user account name is for Amazon. They will give you an, an at kindle.com address. And so you can actually email yourself documents, whether it's a Word document, an EPUB. I don't think they support Mobi anymore. I think they've made the switch from their proprietary one to EPUB, but you can send PDFs as well. And those will appear in your Kindle reader and you could just use it as sort of a document management um, application as well. A couple other ones, a full reader and one that I like to use is Blue Fire Reader. It's just kind of like a generalized um, application that that you can store documents in and and use it as a reader. I like the Blue Fire Reader because it has a really nice uh, thumb swipe to dim or brighten the text. Um, Both of these uh, apps will also support black on white text, which is kind of, if you can imagine, normally with books we have white uh, pages or like a white, like if you're using a Word document, it's white, and then you have black is your text. I like to flip those around and have black and have white text. It's a little bit softer on the eyes, especially if you're reading in the evening. Like if you can imagine cuddling up at the end of the night and you're reading a little bit of a you know, a chapter book with your daughter or your son, you maybe don't want that screen to be as bright um, and flipping it from black background 
going to a black background with a white text is really nice. And then Blue Fighter Reader allows you to swipe up and down to dim the text. And I found that to be very helpful, especially when you're at the, in the evening and you're reading and you're looking at a screen. I found that to be helpful. Next is document creation. Obviously, again, going back to Google Docs, you have Docs, Sheets, Slides. You have a ton of apps right there for free built in. You can also support Word. So if you are a Word person, you can actually um, sync up your Word 365 account. Um, you can do all storage on the, on the Google, on the Microsoft OneDrive uh, network if you want to store documents there, but it may actually cost you some money for the year. So be, be aware of like cost associated with that. But a lot of families may, you know, pay for 365 or maybe have it as part of their corporate account. Maybe their, their spouse has it. Um, and you can share that across your private accounts as well. It, it's up to what, it's up to you, what, what you have. Another one would be like something like Evernote as well, where you kind of have like a note taking app that has the a lot of capabilities that's really a fun one i used to use um, also if you're using something like canva uh, you're trying to create documents canva is supported on on the tablets as well so if you're making like worksheets or you're printing off um, really creative little you know coloring pages or something of that nature you can use canva for that as well and then a really really popular one that's only available on ios is called good notes it's very popular uh, note-taking and document creation app. So check that one out as well. Next thing I like to do as well for me, um, because I'm a slave to the badge uh, on the icon. So if you have an app that has a notification that says, hey, you need to do something or there's a notification, I always like to have those set to zero. So that's a great, you know, kind of like an OCD tick on my, on my part that I use to my advantage is that I have um, an app called Strides. So that's like a daily uh, goal. So like, for example, I like to you know, get my writing in, I got to work out, I got to clean up around the house. Um, I got to drink water and I got to sleep and I got to read, <laughs> you know? So it's like a to-do app that, that I leverage because it has a little badge icon. And, and because I know I want to drive that down to zero, that helps me, um, you know, accomplish my daily goals, whatever that might be. Another one that I like to use is called minimal, minimalist, minimalist. And it's a, just a very, very simple rudimentary list taking app that you can just cross things off, shake the phone and it deletes the things you've finished. I really like it. I put a link, I'll put a link down below for it. It's a great thing for me to like, just say, Hey, you know, like instead of writing on a piece of paper and having that in my pocket on my little to-do list, I can just quickly type out a bunch of of items in a list, if I'm going to the store, if I things I got to get done today, whatever it might be, I like to use that as kind of like a to-do list. Um, so next going on, so that was basically how, how the educator can use it and how the educator can use those apps. For the learner, you know, obviously we're, we're trying to learn on the go. So, you know, w with a tablet that is used often, there's also, there's often an intimacy that's associated with the technology. And so our learners will have this kind of connection to the device that they'll obviously they'll treat it as their own. Um, but to have the device be a center of their education, it can, it can actually, um, the tablet will be a source of, of inspiration or, or connection with their education and they'll associate their education with the tablet. So if you think if you're, if you're trying to build in sort of this educational aspect, the tablet may become a source of, you know, association with education. So you want to try to make that experience positive um, as opposed to like a detrimental experience where they're, you know, oh, you're, you're, you know, you're in trouble. You can't use your tablet. Well, if you use your tablet as sort of a educational device, it will be hard to use that as, you know, if they're doing something wrong or they're not paying attention or whatnot, it's hard to take that away from them because you are using that as part of their education. So you may want to keep that in mind when you're using the tablet for their education, especially if you're putting on things on, on, on the tablet that maybe are not as educational, maybe games and things of that nature. And so you would have to restrict certain applications and they may then have issues or, you know, emotional issues around the tablet and the education involved with that. So be, be a little bit of aware of that, that there, there is that intimacy involved in the tablet and the technology and how you may use that and how you may have to restrict some of it and how that may impact the learner's, you know, expectations around the tablet. Another thing, the learners often lose things. So, you know, we've always heard the story of like the lost papers, the school pages, you know, these are pages one, two, and five. Well, where are three and four? You know, it's like, you know, 
be aware that they may lose the tablet. And that is something we want to want to make sure that they understand um, right up front that this is a costly thing, but also this is a benefiting thing, right? Like I don't have these loose pieces of paper that I can lose and, and everything is on the tablet right there for, for you to, to work on. So, you know, there are some pros and cons when using these tablets um, for the learners. You may also, you know, this will reduce the need for lots of materials. A lot of times, um, a cluttered backpack or a cluttered experience or a cluttered life can lead to a cluttered mind. Um, and if we can limit the amount of things that are, you know, our kids are having to take around, if they can, you know, you know, the dream of having a small backpack with a simple tablet, maybe a notebook and some paper and a pencil, you know, that's all they would may, maybe need. And then that could be a very, um, more simplified experience for them with their education and may help, help them, you know, to kind of declutter their lives. And, you know, I've seen a lot of kids that are our parent partnership and they have these backpacks and absolutely stuffed. And the parents have thousands of pages and notebooks and everything. And, you know, reducing everything into a, ta- a single tablet experience may, may be a beneficial thing for you and your family. Um, managing the education, managing, you know, what they are doing and what they are learning, um, managing their experience around their education may be a good thing. The next thing I like about it is that there's the media could be all in one place. So if you need to watch a YouTube video for your, your lecture, say for example, you're doing the um, you're you're doing the prehistory curriculum and you need to watch an Eons video today, and you have to help your other kid with their math homework. Great, we'll dial up the Eons video, get the headphones out, you can then help them with their math homework, and that you can see that you can use your tablet to help bring in all that media. Next, once the Eons video is done, they got to do a worksheet or maybe they're doing some artwork that's dinosaur, um, so, you know, associated to the dinosaurs, or maybe they're doing some digital coloring pages that are dinosaur related. All that media can be put into one place. And that's something I really, really like. Furthermore, you know, one of the things you know, we're always afraid of screens, but we do know that the digital world will be the future for our children, especially if they go into tech or in some type of, um, you know, business world, you know, they're going to be typing, they're going to be using computers, they're going to have to navigate applications, they're going to have to find information digitally, and they need to be comfortable with that. They need to have those skills. And it's hard for us to want to restrict that when we know that is so important because it's part of our daily lives. I mean, I couldn't do my job, you know, when I worked Um, without my computer. And I know Ariel can't do it either. And it's such an integral piece of what we do on a day-to-day basis, both our phones, like, cause a lot of us in the corporate world, we got to answer emails and we got our phones to, you know, we'll have a corporate phone or something like that, or we'll have teams on our phone and we got to, you know, update a quick message to our, our coworkers. You know, we, we need to be able to navigate these tools and know how to use them. And so this is a great way for, you know, our learners to begin to become more, more, you know, I remember when I went to school and college, I, I, it was like just before, you know, computers were really a thing. And I remember I learned to type on AOL instant messenger because everybody on my, my floor was on that. And that was really my first moment I learned to type. Otherwise I was like two finger typing or my mom would like, I'd handwrite write uh, an essay and she'd type it for me really quick. You know, those are the old days. And nowadays we're expecting, you know, our kids to be able to type on a computer by the time they're 10 or 11 or 12, right? They're, they're writing essays and whatnot, you know, a thousand words here or 1200 words here. You don't want that handwritten. You know, you want to be able to type that out really fast. And, you know, that's something we've got to become comfortable with that th- it is a digital world and they do need to have these skills. And so, you know, preparing them for those life skills with our, ta- you know, with a tablet or some type of computer um, may become a, an important thing. So let's talk a little bit about some apps for the learner. So it'll be a little bit different. You know, there'll, there'll be some overlap with what we do for the educator, but, you know, there'll be some apps that are obviously very different for, for the learner. Starting out, obviously, the cloud storage thing as well. You know, we started with the, the educator. Same thing for the learner as well. Google Drive, Microsoft, Dropbox, any type of cloud storage may become very necessary, um, especially if it's, if, if it's tied to a certain account, especially with Google. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but, you know, having an account for your student that is unique to them that where they're sharing documents with you or you're, you're able to work, you know, see what they're doing with respect to what documents they're producing, having that cloud storage there. Um, document creation, I would almost, 
say, ubiquitous Google Drive for every student. Um, I know Chromebooks are super popular in the public schools. And I think a lot of the kids, when they were during the pandemic, they were, they were given uh, Chromebooks uh, to work from. You know, with the Chromebook comes the Google Drive setup. And I know a lot of companies use, will use Google Drive, sort of like a corporate product. Um, it's, so, it's so ubiquitous. It's free. Um, I, I, I love it. I've used it for years. I mean, decades now I've been, I've been a Google user for going on. I was, I was in beta Google Gmail for way back in the day, 2003 or 2004 timeframe. So I've been, you know, in the Google platform for about 20 years and Google drive, I think is one of the best platforms to use. Um, I do presentations for my writer's group off of them. I write my books on them. I can't, I can't think of it highly enough. I love it because it's in the cloud. I don't have to worry about what device I'm on. I don't have to sit down and you know, I can work anywhere at any time as long as I have access to my, my Google account. Um, I just love it. Um, next for videos, my biggest recommendation is YouTube. And then if you can, if you can afford it, um, the YouTube premium, getting the family plan, making sure that all devices have um, ad-free YouTube. I find ad-free YouTube to be one of the most useful things out there. There's so many videos to watch, so many things you can learn. And if you have to sit and watch a 30 second or a minute and a half video uh, advertisement before, you know, watching some educational lecture or even just trying to find the right video, it just, it's, it's really annoying to have to watch a 30 second video to figure out if it's the right video that you wanted to watch. And I found once I had YouTube premium that I used YouTube more, not in the sense that I like binged more videos, I just used it and I was able to find what I wanted faster and then I didn't have to wait for it. And having to watch the videos and you know the advertisements, we don't know what we're being advertised. You don't want your kids sitting there staring at, you know, advertising videos just to watch, you know, some video on like, you know, how you know how it's made, you know, the Discovery Channel show on, you know, how how do they make basketballs, you know? <laughs> like you have to watch a 30 second ad about, you know, I don't know, some digital product or something like that. And you're just like, well, you shouldn't have to do that. So YouTube premium, I always find to be very, very, very useful. Also, you can listen to videos with the screen off and you can also download videos to a local device, which I find to be a very, very nice feature, especially if it's like music um, or if it's like, I, I like to use ambient music while I'm working or if I have a lecture that I wanna watch, um, like, oh, I wanna watch the Brandon Saracen a video about the writing that he gave at BYU. And I can download one of those videos and I can listen to that anywhere. So I don't have to worry about like, you know, using my my wireless uh, data to download a, a YouTube video. I have it downloaded locally on my phone. Like th those are some really nice features that come with YouTube Premium. Beyond that, so there's some basic education videos that uh, apps that we use and I'd love to know what you guys use. Um, we, we obviously use Khan Academy Kids. There's also Khan Academy. I think those are super powerful apps, just generalized educational apps that anyone can use. Um, I really like them. If you're doing any type of language, obviously Duolingo, and there's a bunch of others out there, but if you're trying to learn a language, those are really nice apps. You can imagine having those already pre preloaded on the, on the tablet. Also spatial learning. I love Google Earth. I love Google Maps. My daughter always loves to just kind of poke around um, on Google Maps and just kind of look and zoom in and and tap on different businesses and seeing the images of those stores or the restaurants or the landmarks or whatever it might be, just giving them that time to kind of explore the world digitally, I found to be really, really helpful. So having maps in Google Earth, and especially if you guys are talking about something, you could be anything from, oh, you know, where where did Napoleon lose at Waterloo? You know, it's like, okay, well, let's go zoom in on where that is or you know, where's the, you know, the Strait of Magellan in, you know, in South America and okay, let's go find it. And like, let's zoom in or let's zoom in on Mount Everest and find the tallest, you know, mountain in the world or, you know, Mauna Loa is erupting. Let's, let's look at the lava flow patterns um, from Google Earth or Google Maps. You know, so like those are really, really cool things you can do uh, with your learner that, that may spark additional interest. So Google Maps and Google Earth, I think are very, very, very important. There's also a massive list of just targeted applications, whether it's reading, math, coding, there, there's millions of them and everybody has their recommendations. So that's where I would love for you guys to put your recommendations for like the targeted learning apps and put those into the comments and put them on Facebook. We'd love to hear what you guys are using. There's so many out there. It's hard to even list, you know, 
one or two or whatnot. So feel free to put those out there. Next thing, talk a little bit about digital pens. So if you have a stylus on your, on your tablet, both active or passive styluses. Passive styluses are just ex essentially extensions of your finger. So obviously, if you touch the device with your finger, having the stylus that's just passive means it's just an extension of your finger. What's cool about the active styluses is that they have this kind of a three-dimensional touching. So if you like press a little bit harder, it can detect that. Um, it's really, really nice if you're doing artwork um, or any type of like delicate movements that, it, that needs to be registered, it can actually feel that pressure. Um, and you need to have an, you need to uh, um, align your active stylus with a, with a tablet that supports active stylus. So an active pen may not work on some of the lower end tablets. So you want to make sure that you have a, uh, a tablet that supports the active styluses and the active styluses can be a little bit more pricey, 50 bucks, hundred dollars. The passive styluses, you can get 10 for 20 bucks, right? Um, the active ones have a little bit of thinking inside of them. They have a battery that needs to be charged. So just realize that the active stylus and the passive stylus, you need to make sure your tablet aligns with that. That gets right into the, the next one, which is the art tools. So if your children want to get into digital artwork, uh, one, of the, one of the big ones is Procreate. Um, another one, Artflow. Um, and having a passive, having a digital pen, a stylus can really help with the drawing of the, you know, making selections and then doing the drawing, the active styluses are the ones where this is really, really important, where they may have palm rejection. So as you're working with the, the tablet, your hand may be on the tablet, but it rejects that, that touch of your palm. It may reject a touch of like a knuckle on the finger. If you touch it on the, on the tablet, it's really just working from the pen. So if you're wanting to get into kind of the digital art or your child is looking to do that, you may want to get a tablet that supports an active stylus and then buy an active stylus because it'll have these wonderful features that will allow the budding young artist of your child um, to use the features to their full advantage. Um, having a passive stylus is a little bit of challenging when you're doing digital art because the active styluses have just so many features built into it. Furthermore, if you're looking to do handwriting, Notability um, is a good app. Another one is uh, the Calligraphy Handbook. Um, these are, you know, just if you want to just have your child explore handwriting or, or trying to do beautiful handwriting, uh, whatever that might be, um, you can absolutely use uh, your digital pens, whether it's a passive or an active, uh, active stylus to do those, to you work on handwriting in those apps. Next thing is, is if you have a tablet, my goodness, you also have, a filming device, like you can film videos, you can do stop motion uh, animation, you can take photos, you can you can imagine staging, you know, enormous dinosaur um, scenes, um, recreating famous scenes from movies with your Legos, whatever it might be. You have that built into the tablet because almost every single ta every single tablet has a camera and has the ability to shoot video. Um, one of my favorite apps to use is the Filmic Pro. It's a little pricey, um, but I really, they, I think there's a Filmic Basic. There's like just um, a basic version of it that's a little bit cheaper. Um, and it allows you a lot of creative features. You can set color, you can set aperture, you can set the, the size of the video, 4K or 1080p or whatever you wanna do. A lot of great features there. Um, if they want to shoot something, obviously stop motion, you can use power director or stop motion studio. Um, if you want to create some type of scene on your Legos or whatever it might be super powerful, especially if they want to get into film and they want to use their, um, use the tablet for a creative, a creative outlet, which is film and, and, um, and pictures as well. So obviously there's the, there's the built-in photo app. There are a million photo apps out there for taking beautiful photos and using filters and whatnot. You know, your child might be interested in photography and they can use their tablet to take beautiful photos as well. Moving beyond doing photos and film, doing music. Simply Piano is a great introduction to, you know, starting to create music on the, on a tablet. 
Mood Scraper is a cool one where if you want to do like ambient music, your kid may just want to sit there and make some music and play on the piano. They can do that on their tablet. I really like that. And especially if they want to learn how to play music and want to learn how to, you know, um, write and, 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 and play and learn and, and, and understand how music theory um, is applied, using a tablet to do that is really, really nice. Furthermore, the reading applications. So if you have a young reader who is reading, you can, just like with the educator, if you, you know, the educator can sit there and, and use the tablet to read to the student. The student can also use the tablet to read as well. Libby, Kindle Reader, you know, obviously the Blue Fire Reader, we talked about those before. You can put books on those accounts. You can put books into those, those apps so that they can read, you know, whenever. Um, I, I like to have my Kindle as well, my, my e-reader. Um, but I do find myself, I read on my iPhone, I read on a tablet. It's become a, I, I always thought I would never do it, but I actually do. And uh, reading on a digital device is actually very easy. It's kind of my preferred method now of uh, using my phone or my e-reader to read books. I rarely open books. Periodically I do, but um, most of the time I'm just reading on my digital devices now. And I think our students will do the same. Next, if you're doing audiobooks, the two biggest ones, uh, Libby, which is through the audio, you know, through the library, you can check out audiobooks there. Also, I have found YouTube. YouTube has a ton of audiobooks. A lot of people will put audiobooks out there. They'll do their own readings of certain books. Um, they will also, you, there's a ton of books that are in the public domain that have been read, you know, so classic literature. Really great way to find that. Also, there's Audible. It can be a little pricey um, buying books, but, you know, there's a subscription option there. And if you want to listen to audiobooks there, I would prefer you know, recommending because our children are, they're so, you know, they're, they're bottomless well that I need to use the library system because I can't afford to get her. I can't afford to buy her, um, an audio book for every single book that she wants to read, um, because it's so many of them, right? So I love to use the, the library to do that. And it's just so affordable. And what's great about the Libby app is that, it, you know, if you sign in uh, across multiple devices, the download is there across those devices as well. So I have it on the phone. I have it on the tablet. It's really, really nice to be able to access your audiobooks and even your, your, you know, your e-reading books, um, your digital books as well on the Libby app. So it's like a nice, like one-stop shop for that. Next, if you're doing podcasts, you all are listening to a podcast. Now you have your favorite way to do that, whether it's YouTube or whether it's like, I like to use downcast. You can use the Apple podcast, Podbean, Spotify, whatever that might be. You can curate a list of podcasts that your student can listen to and learn. There's a ton of children based, uh, children focused, uh, podcasts out there, whether it's a science podcast, whether it's, um, educational, you know, informational, you know, politics, you know, reading books, um, to, to the children, entertaining stories, whatever it might be, there's an app out there uh, for you to be able to download those podcasts. Um, very often it'd be the same one that you enjoy using right now. Next is informational. So obviously you can download a Wikipedia app, the, the internet's encyclopedia, right? It's the most important thing I think um, on the on the web is the Wikipedia. It's like repos central repository of information. You can download that so your student, if they're looking up some information, they can go right to the Wikipedia app and, and answer any answer, you know, answer any question they may have. Um, another thing that we like to do because we're like starting to get into hiking and everything, having all trails on our tablet and our phone um, is a great way for us to, you know, look up new trails, look up places to go. Um, uh, try to find more information on, on, you know, a areas around us, um, try to find new locations for us to go and visit and hike to. And, you know, let this lake over here, or this, this stream over here, this waterfall over here, really nice. Um, we did a whole podcast on the seek app. Um, really, really nice to find, you know, plants and, and bugs and animals and try to identify those really nice. Google also has an app for arts and culture. So if you're looking for, you know, art and different type of like historical things, really, really powerful there. Next is, uh, we'll talk a little bit about headphones. So obviously your learner may, you know, a lot of these apps have some type of capability of producing noise and that may not be useful at all times. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, especially if they're listening to something or if they're watching something, having a nice set of headphones, um, are really, really nice. Now you can have just simple earbuds that are wired that plug right in. You can get those for 10 bucks. That's really just fine. You can get some wireless uh, earbuds or like um, the Apple ear earbuds or, or 
um, some type of uh, standard knockoff version of that. I know the Apple ones tend to be a little expensive, but you can get um, wireless earbuds, um, I think for like 40 bucks. I love them because not having the wire is super nice, but you can lose them and it's you gotta make sure you're charging them. So that's a little bit of an issue. There's also the over the ear headphones. Um, I know my daughter likes using those for her audiobooks. Um, there's both wired and non-wired versions of those. If you do go for a Bluetooth wireless kind of over the ear headphones, make sure they come also with the ability to connect with an actual wire in case those headphones lose power. So they can just kind of double back as, as a regular standard headphones that just plug right into the jack. I really like those, but I think most tablets and phones now are trying to push us all to the wireless options. So I think in the, in going forward, we need to start thinking about getting headphones that are, are wireless for our children. And I think, um, this coming up for Christmas, I think, uh, there'll be some wireless headphones under the Christmas tree. Um, so we'll see, we'll see, uh, what happens there, but yeah, wireless versus wired. And one of the things that I've always seen is my daughter's like, you know, she's like working with Legos and she's got the wired headphones and she's having to lug around the, <laughs> the tablet with her, uh, because she, you know, she's got the wired headphones and she doesn't want to hit pause. And so it creates a danger of dropping or breaking something or tripping or falling. So I think the wireless headphones will be a nice addition. Um, furthermore, if you're just, if you need to access certain curriculum or certain websites and whatnot, obviously the Chrome browser is probably the, one of the better ways for you to, um, to access those things. So if you're doing like Beast Academy, Explode the Code, IXL, things like, you know, if you have like a, uh, some type of curriculum that you're doing through a charter or something of that nature, you may need to access that through a web browser. I like the Chrome browser. You can use Firefox, Brave, uh, even Safari as well. But uh, the Chrome one I think is the best. You can, you can do a lot of controls and parental controls around that. And I find that to be very helpful um, especially going forward. I, my daughter doesn't do too much on Chrome. She's really app focused. Um, so I, she hasn't had to, you know, once you go into a Chrome browser, you can go anywhere. And so you do want to make sure you're limiting, um, what type of things are available there. So just going back, just kind of like wrapping it up here is, you know, obviously our, we choose to have our tablets be a source of education and we don't do too many games on the tablets. Um, it's really just strictly activities that are educational. Um, we treat it as a learning vehicle, not a toy. Um, we tend to not do very many videos like movies on, on the tablets because we don't want that to be a, a distraction. Uh, so movies are on televisions. We do use YouTube on, on the tablets, but it's really just specifically educational stuff. That's just our choice. Um, all of our kids have Google accounts and when they are old enough, they will be then logged into those accounts on their tablets. And they have, you know, they have a Gmail account that has their name um, and it allows us to kind of like control and synchronize all of all of the various accounts on our one account. And that allows us to be parents to the children and we can then set parental controls on what things the Google products can do, whether it's Chrome or whether it's Google Drive. We have access to that as a kind of a shared parental account. And we found that to be really, really nice. Next, just remember about the digital pens. If you do do a digital pen, a stylus, and you need to have an active stylus, you need to make sure you have a, a tablet that supports that. So like, for example, if you want an active stylus, I think the Samsung Galaxy Tab S3 and then the iPad Pro all support active styluses, but you wanna make sure that before you buy an active stylus, that you make sure you get a, a tablet that supports that. If that is something that you're going to need to do going forward, otherwise you just need you're going to be using the passive stylus, and those are not as like they're useful. They're really good. They work, but they're they don't have those added features that you may want. And some apps may be angling towards the active styluses and maybe not have as many features for the passive styluses. So just be aware of that as well. If you are choosing to do them, you know, we didn't talk about the Microsoft Surface because that's more of a, t a PC than a tablet. And I'm sure there's the Microsoft people that would scream at me and say that, no, we, we, we look and feel like a tablet now and blah, blah, blah. But they can tend to be a little bit more expensive. There's a lot of pros and cons of that. It doesn't, I know they have the look and feel now that's more mobile, that kind of that mobile feel um, in the operating system, the old Microsoft tablet experience was just a PC on a tablet. And I think they've changed a little bit of the look and feel. 
So do think about that if you if you are kind of like a Microsoft PC family. Um, a Surface may be an option, but they can tend to be a little bit more expensive. And then furthermore, last thing I always like to say is uh, don't be that person who loses everything on their tablets. Back up, back up, back up your, your tablets. Pay for additional storage if possible. Um, I do not blink an eye paying a couple bucks a month to add a lot more additional storage to make sure that everything that I have is stored into the cloud in case something fails. You know, the tablet could fall in the, in the tub. The phone could fall into the pool. You don't know what it is. You want to make sure everything is safe and you don't lose anything. So just remember to back up, back up, back up, pay for the additional storage if possible. Um, it does make sure you, you back up all your app content as well. It, a lot of times that is an option that you need to enable and to turn on. So if you're storing something or if you're doing something in a certain app, make sure you have that stored as a backup in case something were to you know catastrophically fail that you could then re restore that content as well. Whether it's images or documents, make sure you have that, that feature enabled as well. And then finally, just remember that the tablet, I always like to think of tablets and phones as things that deliver content and they're not a repository. So again, going to the backup, 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 you know, you don't want those devices to be the, the, the end all for, for whatever you're doing, whether it's a, you know, your photos or your documents or, you know, the content, maybe your, your student is, you know, filling out sheets or doing math problems. You don't want to lose those because it was stored on, oh, this app and it wasn't backed up um, because, oh, now I have to do the reporting and I've lost, you know, Johnny's last three months of math work. You don't want to run into that type of experience. So you want to make sure you're storing as much of that content or backing up that content as much as possible. I, I really, I cannot, I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, so hopefully this helps you. I know it's a little bit of a longer episode. I'm sorry it was solo. Um, but hopefully as you start to think about using tablets and digital devices in your, your home school, that you can take these things into account. When we post this video, feel free to go into the comments and go onto Facebook as well to tell us what type of apps you like to use because I think that's the best way that people find new apps. Um, you know, we all have a thousand apps on our phone from the Chipotle app to the Walmart app. We do Walmart pickup to, you know, what is the, you know, RSS, you know, reader that you like or the podcast reader or the, the note taking or your weather app, you know, who knows what it might be. We all have a million apps on our phones and our devices. And there's, you know, out there, you guys are using something to help your, you know, your kids are loving. So feel free to share that. We'd love to hear about that. So, so thanks so much for joining us and we hope you guys enjoy uh, building out your tablet-based learning platform. Thanks so much for joining us today and making us a part of your homeschool journey. Please engage with us on social media. Join our Homeschool Together podcast group on Facebook and find us at Homeschool Together podcast on Instagram. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, and recommendations. Until next time. Happy homeschooling!